Welcome to the Standing Up to Pots podcast, otherwise known as the Potscast. This podcast is dedicated to educating and empowering the community about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, commonly referred to as POTS. This invisible illness impacts millions and we are committed to explaining the basics, raising awareness, exploring the research, and empowering patients to not only survive, but thrive. This is the Standing Up to POTS podcast. Hello, fellow POTS patients and nice people who care about POTS patients. I'm Jill Brooke, and today we have an episode of the POTS Diaries, where we get to know someone in the POTS community and hear their story. So today we are speaking with Rob, who volunteered to share his story when I asked for some men to step forward to tell us about their experience. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So maybe we can start out with just some basics about you, like what's your age, where did you grow up, and where do you live now? I'm 34, and I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and that's where I currently am. So how do you not have a Southern accent? (laughs) Uh, Lots of practice. (laughs) So can you just give us a snippet, like what were you like as a little kid? Curious, always curious you know, pretty, pretty active, kind of played outside a lot, was into whatever fad it was, time, Pokemon, video games, that kind of stuff. And so now, like, how would your friends or family describe your personality? Patient, kind, sweet, and probably sometimes irreverent. Okay, so if we were to force you to brag about yourself, what would you say? What are you good at? Or what are you proud of? What am I good at? I feel like I have pushed bodybuilding with chronic illness just about as far as you can. I don't know of too many other people who have done what I've done. And, you know, I think hopefully people out there I'm just not aware of, but I feel like I've pushed it about as far as you can push it. And I'm pretty proud of that. Ooh, I'm excited to hear more about that. Okay, but first, I guess I'm hoping to hear, like, did you have some years of your life before any chronic illness set in? And if so, how many of those did you have? Yeah, well, you know, looking back, I go, oh, okay, I think this was a pot symptom or this was a pot symptom, but it was not debilitating until I was probably around 23. So I would say I had relatively normal health. I, I, I got sick a lot, I think, when I was early, maybe like second, third, first, second, third grade, um, just with normal kind of childhood kid illnesses. But I would say my life was somewhat normal up until about age 23. So can you give us kind of a snapshot of what that life looked like before you had POTS show up? Sure. Went through school, um, high school, pretty fine, Uh, went to college, decided that's not exactly the track I wanted to be in. So I enrolled in a technical school for a year and worked as an automotive technician for Nissan and then decided that's not what I wanted to do. So I actually went back to school. And when I was back at university, um, that's when the dysautonomia really kicked up and I really began noticing symptoms, kind of really bad timing on that. So what was your first sign that something was really wrong? Lack of refreshing sleep was my first main symptom and continues to be one of my most debilitating. So when you say that, like how many hours would you spend in bed and what's the experience of unrefreshing sleep for people who maybe aren't familiar with it? So unrefreshing sleep, I would describe as the time in bed is almost irrelevant. It's how do you feel when you wake up? That's the real determining factor. And that's how I would describe unrefreshing sleep or non-restorative sleep as it's sometimes known. Yeah, so at the time, what did you think was going on? Like, did you seek medical attention for that or how did you deal with it? I did seek medical attention for that. And I've had a interesting relationship with the medical systems. I'm sure many people who have this disease have had. Yeah, sought treatment for it and The first doctor I saw initially said, you know, oh, you're too young, you know, the typical, oh, you're too young to be this sick. And then I actually went to a sleep specialist who was the first one to mention dysautonomia. 
and I got, I got tested for it here in Birmingham and did the tilt test and I didn't pass out completely, but it came back positive. And they were just like, ah, oh, exercise and beta blockers and just kind of sent me on my way. And as we know now, it's a much more complex disorder than simply a fast heart rate, right? And totally did not address the sleep. And when I was there talking about, well, I'm here because I can't sleep. Well, well, you need to see a sleep doctor. Well, the sleep doctor sent me over here and you get that run around. So I, I didn't get anywhere locally. So I essentially asked my doctor to referral from the Mayo Clinic and went up there in 2013 and had to do another tilt table to actually pass down the tilt table this time, which I'm glad I didn't pass down the first one because the restraints weren't exactly very much on the first one that the one at Mayo Clinic, they have you strapped in six different ways. But I saw a sleep specialist and he too was very dismissive of the um, unrefreshing sleep. He no joke suggested I get into building model airplanes to get my mind off of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just have to pause you there a second so that we can all smack our foreheads, shake our heads, laugh so that we don't scream. He thought building model airplanes was going to be your solution. <laughs> well, I think it was just, you know, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with BS approach to medicine. That's that's what he said. It was just, just dismissiveness um, and possibly some gaslighting there and all you know kinds of unhealthy dynamics. But um, yeah, that's what he said. And even at Mayo, you kind of have a main doctor who's kind of your coordinator. I'm sure you've talked to people or you've been through that. And they were basically said, you know, here's my to you get your blood pressure up, you're a moving target, you know, we can fix that and still treated it as a cardiac only issue. Now I did have orthostatic intolerance, tachycardia, those were things I had, but they didn't address any of the sleep problems or gastrointestinal problems or any of the brain fog or cognitive issues that come along with it as well. And this is in 2013. So I don't know what the evolution of that is on the practitioner side, whether they've evolved their thinking very much on that or not. Um, I think COVID may be, be a big catalyst for that. And I think that's one of the big silver linings in all of this is we're seeing, oh yeah, viruses do have way more of an effect on the human body than we previously thought. Did you trace your dysautonomia back to any particular trigger like a virus or anything? You know, I've thought a lot about that. And the sick, most ill I've ever been, aside from you know all the stuff I deal with now, was when I was just a few months old, I had a very serious case of viral encephalitis and almost died. I was in the hospital. And, you know, I've mentioned that to doctors. I was like, oh, you know, there's brush off, whatever. But now that we've gone through COVID, I think that may have been the catalyst, as best I can tell, with the best evidence I have for what I deal with currently. So what do you deal with currently? How many of the symptoms have you been able to improve? How many are still there? All of the symptoms are still there that I originally had. Some have gotten better through the weight training that I do. The cardiac issues have improved. And I still am orthostatically intolerant. I still get a really fast heart rate. I'm heat intolerant. The symptoms that have more of an impact on me are the unrefreshing sleep and the gastrointestinal issues. And I haven't really, I've made some progress with that, but those are the ones that have been really tough to crack. How do you deal with heat in Alabama? Ha, air conditioning. I, I become kind of nocturnal in the summertime. I get out and do stuff at night. That's how I deal with it. <laughs> I tried to do that and it just did not work for me. And I eventually actually moved to Alaska to avoid heat. Okay. And that was the one place where it's great in the summertime because, you know, it's light until, you sure. know, midnight and then it's light again at 2 a.m. So if you have insomnia, you can go for a walk almost any time of the day or night and it's not dark. But yeah, that sounds tough. Now, you had also mentioned orthostatic intolerance and cardiac things but you look super fit. You mentioned that you've taken fitness far for somebody with your issues. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, I wanna kind of illustrate the framework for what made me decide to even do this. So lifting weights kind of really started for me in high school because I didn't wanna take PE. 
And that was an alternative to get out of PE. Did not like PE, not really into sports either. I thought, okay, this will get me out of doing that. And then didn't really pick it back up until I was at university again and started kind of becoming more serious about it. But that's when I started getting really sick. And it was about five or six years ago, I attempted to kind of get back into it and I had a few false starts. But my main reasoning was since I had orthostatic intolerance, you know, they always say, you know, do cardio for POTS, do cardio, do cardio. Cardio is good, but in my opinion, it does nothing to strengthen the muscles to aid in the skeletal muscle pump. So that was my thesis. I want to actually build muscle, induce hypertrophy to aid in the skeletal muscle pump because that's the backup in most people, but it's our primary means of maintaining blood pressure in, in POTS. So that was kind of my working hypothesis, right? So I thought, okay, well, the best way to build muscle is, I mean, bodybuilding routines, that's what it does. It induces hypertrophy. It's a, an endeavor that builds muscle. So that's kind of how I got into that. And it was really hard when I first started out, I had to take mitodrine and to raise my blood pressure and a beta blocker to lower my heart rate when I first started getting in there. And that's, that allowed me to actually get in there. And I progressed to the point where I didn't need the beta blocker and eventually didn't need the mitodrine. Now, I could always slide back into that. It always requires constant effort to upkeep what you've built and you can always regress. So I wouldn't say I'm permanently off that because it may be a point where my health gets worse and I have to go back on it. But currently I'm not on those medications and being in the gym has helped me uh, achieve that. So did you have to start with like non-upright exercises or can I just ask like how, how much fatigue or dysfunction were you dealing with in the beginning? Did you like, what did you build up from? Where were you when you started? Well, I weighed 146 pounds. I'm 6'2", so that gives you an idea of about where I was. And until COVID happened, I was at about 200. So I had gained quite a bit of mass over that time. Wait, so are you saying you had put on like 60 pounds of muscle? Well, some of it was fat, it was, but not much fat. So probably, eh, probably about 40 pounds of muscle, yeah. Okay, wow. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over several years. Yeah, it was it was had to fight for every ounce of it. But I basically started with kind of the compound lifts, the bench, the deadlift, and the squat. And I found that the orthostatic intolerance when you're deadlifting, you're taking a big breath in and you're kind of bracing. So you're kind of, you know, you're holding your breath, everything's all tight. And I can lift, but once I release that tension, then that's when the orthostatic intolerance really kind of hits me. I have to go sit down or something like that. Interesting. But you can do a full workout being upright? Well, not every single thing I do is standing. Sometimes I'm sitting on a bench or I'm laying down or something. But um, yeah, I can, do, I can do a lot of things standing, standing upright. But it's... Um, you know, certain things are easier to do than others. It just kind of depends on the, uh, the exercise. But generally, I'm like leaning on something or I'm sitting in something generally, unless I'm just like doing some type of free weight thing. So for people listening, there's a type of exercise called isometric. I think of isometric exercises as ones where you're doing a lot of work, but you're not really moving, right? Like a wall sit or a plank or something where you're holding a steady position and if I'm getting that right, and that's part A of the question, am I? But part B is, can you do that kind of thing? Or do you find that you need to have your skeletal pump going, like your calves pumping in order to exercise? Or, or can your body handle just holding one position? Well, like when I do curls, I usually do it on a standing preacher bench. So I am, my arms are extended over a bench, but I'm standing and my legs are pretty tight. So usually if I can do something where I can keep my legs, tension in my legs, whether it's an upper body exercise or not, that typically helps some with that. And on the subject of isometric exercises, I actually do isometric holds uh, for my quad tendons on the top of my knee. I was having some pain in the quad tendons on the top of my knee. 
And uh, I, do iso I do about three sets of 60 second isometric holds before I do any type of lower body, just to kind of um, help reduce any pain or damage to my quad tendon above the kneecap. So that's interesting. And I guess it just shows we're all different because I find that I agree with you that lifting weights works way better for me than doing cardio, largely because I am so orthostatically intolerant that when I lift weights, I'm making sure that every other thing I do is in kind of an almost an upside down position. I do some of these, you know, crazy exercises where I'll, I'll just make sure that I'm doing something kind of upside down for a while because when I spend too much time upright, um, my blood pools too much, but especially during those isometric exercises. And so I feel like I can't even for 10 seconds hold a wall sit or something because of the blood pooling. My, my calves really need to keep on pumping. So I was wondering if that was the case for you, but it sounds like we are two different potsies, not the same thing going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do, I do splits. So I'll do like a pull split and a push split uh, on different days in the gym. Do you mind explaining to people what that is? Because they're probably thinking about like the kind of splits that a dancer does. <laughs> yeah. So you, you don't want to work the same exact muscle back to back days. You want some type of rest time in between. So one way you can work out one day after the next is do different motions and engage different muscles. So generally lifts that require pushing and lifts that require pulling usually use different groups of muscles. There's some overlap there, obviously, for stabilizing muscles and things like that. Uh, but that's generally what I follow. And recently in the past year or so, I've been doing legs on my pull day. So I'll do pull legs and then the following day push and then the following day my day off and then repeat. I don't always get in there that frequently. It kind of depends on how I'm feeling, but that's what I aim for. So do you feel like the weightlifting takes care of your cardio needs or do you also work in some cardiovascular exercise also? I feel as if my heart rate sometimes gets up pretty high weightlifting. So I almost feel like that because I have POTS, my target, I can reach my target heart rate a lot easier. So I kind of feel like that is cardio. I don't really have the energy to do much cardio because I'm usually in the gym for about an hour, two hours. Because, you know, there's a lot of, you have to rest in between sets and there's putting weights on the machine and moving around all this. So there's a lot of things you have to, I'm not actually physically lifting a weight that entire time. Uh, but generally, I mean, I, I go in there and I'm pretty beat when I'm done. I don't really have the energy for a cart too much cardio, but I kind of like it, it treadmill or anything like that. But I kind of feel like the weightlifting is cardio. Now I have done a stair machine because it's low impact, um, but it's not something I do regularly. So that's great. So it sounds like you figured out how to help a lot of your symptoms. Does that make your sleep more refreshing to exercise? Maybe a little bit. I actually had a sleep study done and with, you know, with the EEG and everything. And they said, and this was 10 years ago, mind you, but they said at the time I was having like 45 arousals an hour. That's not waking up and that's just like coming out of deep. So I get very little deep stage sleep. Maybe sometimes, sometimes I'm not sure why. Um, sometimes I'll think, you know, I, did, I don't remember waking up, I dreamed and all that and still feel completely unrefreshed. So that's the best answer I can give you on that, I think. Yeah. So have you found anything else besides exercise that really helps you a lot? I got to the point where I could tolerate some caffeine in the gym without it really, once I kind of got the orthostatic intolerance somewhat addressed, I then start introducing caffeine. So I actually take pre-workout a lot of times when I go in the gym. And actually, I think that helps maintain the blood pressure too. And now if I go for a long time without taking it, sometimes it's, I can tell it speeds up my heart. But generally, it doesn't seem to affect my heart too much anymore. It did when I first was tried it and messed with it. Uh, it sent me, it made me pretty tachycardic. But um, uh, I find pre-workout to be very useful for just having the energy to get in there. That kind of is the catalyst that gets me in there a lot of times creatine, multivitamin, kind of your basic stuff. A lot of people who aren't even sick take, uh, I take magnesium at night and melatonin. That helps a little bit with my sleep, kind of generally helps me fall asleep a little faster. I, I keep it pretty simple supplement wise, because a lot, a, lot a lot of stuff doesn't work. 
So you had mentioned a few minutes ago that you had an interesting relationship with the medical system and that you had encountered maybe some being dismissed, some gaslighting. And I think that maybe some of us in the POTS community assume that that's something that only happens to, you know, the, the young women and kind of the demographic of, oh, you're just a drama queen. But here you are, you said you were what, like six foot two, six foot four or something, and it happened to you? Six, six two, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. By both men, female and male doctors as well. So I don't know how to feel about that. I guess it doesn't make me feel any better. So it's not sexism, it's just potentially something else. I, yeah, I, I think it's just um, really difficult medical cases. I think some doctors would rather just not spend the time and mental energy on it. It's easier just to be dismissive. That's what I think. So do your friends and family know about your POTS? Is it like a very dominant thing in your life? Yeah, I, I'm pretty open with, with describing. I mean, my friends and family, my small little knit group, know pretty well what I, what I deal with because I've been dealing with it pretty consistently for over a decade now. So yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, I sometimes will share studies I read and things like that. I feel like I'm rather transparent with it. So what's the best type of help or support that friends or family could give you? Probably their patience. I think I probably require a little more patience than the average person just because I'm dealing with so much. Sometimes it's hard to get things done in a timely manner or the way I want them to. I mean, if I had to give any advice to anyone, any family member that has someone that's dealing with anything like this, I would say the first thing I would do is just try your best to be really patient with them. Is there anything that you know now about living with POTS that you wish you had known sooner? Oh, yes, absolutely. For sure. I wish I had known everything I know now day one. <laughs> it would have made, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it was a lot of trial and error, years worth, years worth spent reading research articles and you know, things like that. And it's still pretty debilitating, uh, but it's not quite as debilitating as it was. So that would have def, you know, just everything, I guess. So do you mean when you say lots of trial and error, do you mean that you have kind of like figured out lots of little hacks to use throughout the day and night to make everything a little bit easier? Sure. Yeah. For example, I read a study, it was from actually 1986, year I was born. It's kind of interesting that, um, was talking about IBS and psyllium husk usage. And, you know, it took me years to even come across that study because I'd heard here and there about psyllium husk and metamucil and things like that, but I hadn't found a study. So sometimes you just kind of have to be lucky and be on the right website at the right time, use the right keywords to find this stuff. But I've been, I've been kind of hoarding research studies early on. I remember joining the it was either the Dysautonomia International Facebook group or the POTS Facebook group. I don't remember now, but, and I was conversing with someone and they asked me, I, I think I sent them a study or posted a study and someone asked, well, how many of these do you have? And at the time, I think I had about 55 or 60. And they're like, you know, send it over because we're trying to make a repository on the Dysautonomia International website of all these studies. So I think a lot of the stuff I had hoarded contributed to starting to build that database that's currently on that site now. So it sounds like you have really just, for the most part, figured things out for yourself, tried things yourself, that you've been quite independent in, you know, you're, it sounds like maybe a, a team of one who has taken this on for <laughs> largely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I converse with uh, people online, but generally it's, you know, I'm the one who has the executive decision on whether or not to pursue something. So in that respect, yeah, pretty much everything I do is either something I read or something I tried and it kind of worked because generally, you know, when you go to a doctor, generally patient POTS patient knows more than the physician because the POTS patient has time on their hands to just delve really deep into one area. These cardiologists stuff, you know, their scope is broader than that. They don't have the time or the willingness to learn or access to it or motivation to do it. Has anything positive at all come from having POTS? Are there any silver linings at all? It's mostly negative. 
if I'm being if I'm being brutally honest, I'm not one of these people who's like, yeah, it was totally worth it. It's not worth it. I'd rather, you know, not have had to deal with any of this. I think I've I think I've become, and I don't know if this is just general aging, but I feel like I've become more patient because it forces you to kind of learn to be patient with yourself. And I find that that has carried over to other people or can have carry over to other people. So I feel like I'm a little, just a little more patient with life than I used to be. And maybe have a little more unmerited favor for people, I think. Unmerited favor. What do you mean? Just some people would probably describe it as grace, unmerited favor, just kind of not getting as angry with people or kind of cutting them a little more slack here or there, that kind of a thing. For and, and undeserved, you know, they may be being mean to you, but you still try and be nice to them, that kind of a thing. Do you get a lot of the, but you don't look sick type of comments? Yeah, for sure. That's kind of the catch 22 about exercising with this in that, the fitter I look, the harder it is to believe how sick I am. It's a bit of a paradox there. We have what we like to call the speed round, and it's just meant to be a little bit fun. And the idea is you just say the first answer that comes to your head. So what is the drink you find the most hydrating? Liquid IV. What's your favorite time of day and why? Nighttime because my brain works better and I feel better generally. How many doctors have you seen for POTS? Somewhere between 10 to 15. How many other POTS patients have you ever met face to face? Three. What is one word that describes what it's like living with chronic illness? Brutal. What's the best advice anyone ever gave you? The best advice anyone ever gave me. Don't spend too much time worrying what other people think of you because it'll drive you crazy. What is something small that brings you comfort or joy? My phone, because it access to knowledge, connections with people, it's everything. Who is someone that you admire? I'd say my dad. What is something that you're proud of? I am proud of the fact I am still alive because I've had to fight for it. In regards to the POTS? Uh, yeah, in regards to the actual illness itself, the psychological implications of the illness, all of that all rolled into one. Yeah. Do you feel like that part has gotten easier over time? Dealing with it psychologically? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. I think I have more tools to deal with it, but sometimes as it goes on longer and longer and longer, like the weight of that becomes more because it's taken up a larger, it's, continually taking up a larger and larger chunk of my overall life, lifespan, I guess you could say. Yeah. So I guess, are you, are you kind of getting at, I think, a way that many of us have felt at times with chronic illness that sometimes it's just hard. But when you say that you are, you're proud that you're here, do you mean that you had at times thought maybe it was not worth it to be here? Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. Can I ask, and tell me it's, if it's too personal, can I ask what helps you decide that it is worth it to be here? Usually there's something you can look forward to. And I mean anything. Like, I, I look forward to going to the gym. I look forward to seeing friends. I look forward to listening to music. That kind of a thing. And I've, I've found the gym has not also been great for my physical health. I think it helps me emotionally, psychologically as well, too. Wow, I think you nailed something that I had hit on at times when I was struggling with that, which, yeah, it's so important to have things you're looking forward to. And sometimes when chronic illness takes away from you, all of the things or a lot of the things that you previously had looked forward to, it's a really dark place. And, and so I've realized that I now make a very conscious effort to always have little things to be looking forward to. And when other people tell me they're struggling, that's always my first question, uh, you know, is, okay, tell me, you know, good things to look forward to. And I, I think that's a big deal. And I think some of the groups out there, and I have to call out the Dysautonomia Support Network, because I think they've done a really good job of creating activities and groups and clubs 
that I have looked forward to when I, at times when I couldn't do much, couldn't get outside, they have created events and things that, that have served that purpose for me. And so I guess I'm always just kind of curious how other people who have big limitations, you know, so what do you look forward to? Um, so tell me, so like right now, what do you look forward to? I'm looking forward to getting, getting some sleep, eating some food right in the, in the immediate future. I'm actually pretty hungry. Hopefully getting in the gym tomorrow, doing some house work, some house looks a little better. That kind of stuff in the immediate future, seeing my friends. Yeah, even just starting a good binge-worthy um, show on Netflix or something can sometimes like take a few weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I found, I found music will sometimes get me into a better mood or get me into a worse mood, depending on what I listen to. Because I feel like music, it either mirrors what you feel already and amplifies it, or you listen to music to try and change your mood into something that you're into a mood you're currently not in. Can I ask another question about the gym? As we go back to the gym, I'm thinking of more questions. Sure. So do you feel like, like a lot of people when they work out, they get kind of that workout high mm -hmm. or the endorphins going? Do you feel like you get that out of working out? No, I don't feel like I get that from working out. Generally, you get kind of your muscles look a little bigger because blood's flowing in the muscles, so you get kind of a pump, and that feels good. But I wouldn't say, and I've actually thought about that before. I was like, I don't really, get, I don't really get an exercise high. I feel. Do you feel that you have the fatigue that ninety-eight percent of most POTS patients have? That is hard to gauge. My gut reaction to that would be, I feel like mine's more severe because I think so a lot of people have way more cardiac issues than I have, and I have those, but it's not as severe. I feel like for a POTS patient, my fatigue is more severe than average if, if I had to gauge, but that's not to demean or say, oh, I'm so much worse than anybody else. But if I had to, if I was forced to rate that, that's what I would say. So I know you mentioned caffeine. I'm kind of flashing back to times when my fatigue was pretty bad. And I recall getting to the gym and then just like lying spread eagle on a mat for an hour and never actually getting up the energy to do anything. Or times when I would drive to a swimming pool, but never actually get out of the car. I'd, I'd sit there thinking, okay, get up, go. Okay, now go. Okay, you can sit here for one more minute and then you gotta go. And I was wondering if you had, do you struggle to get yourself started and going? Or do you have any tricks? Or how do you, how do you get yourself doing a good workout? most days. Oh yeah, sure. I, I struggle with it constantly. When I take caffeine, you know, you'll see these ads for pre-workout and people talking about how they feel all jacked up and, you know, they're ready to just explode. That's not how I feel when I take it. I feel a little more awake and a little less fatigue. I don't necessarily feel wired. Now, sometimes I've taken it and had a feeling similar to what you had is where I'm still exhausted, but I'm wired at the same time. But that's typically, that's not typical. Generally, I just feel a little less fatigue. Uh, my body feels a little less fatigued, my brain feels a little less fatigued, but it doesn't launch me into some superhuman level of energy or anything close to that. Um, what was the what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Well, if you have any like routine to get yourself going, like do you do a special warm up or do you like I used to I, I used to notice there was a guy at my gym who would sit there for a few minutes and he'd like talk to himself, getting himself psyched up to do a weight workout. And I don't know. Do you have any like ideas for people who are trying to like get themselves energized to get their exercise? Well, what I do, it starts when I first wake up, I generally try to drink some type of electrolyte drink when I first wake up. So my first order of the day is try and get as hydrated as possible. And some days I'm better at that than other days. Sometimes you don't feel like tossing back 32 ounces of water, you know, or with electrolyte powder or whatever. But generally that's why I'm trying to. So I try to make sure I'm really well hydrated. That's a big thing before I go in there. Then usually something like IBS hits me and I have to deal with that for a while. And then, and, and well, I eat for that, and I just hits me. And then, generally, after I get done with that, I will maybe drink a little bit more electrolyte mix, and then I drink the pre-workout. So that's even more liquid inside me, and take creatine, and that kind of whole aids in a little bit of water retention. I think that might help a little bit. And then um, I get in there, and I usually listen to music on headphones. That helps a little bit. And usually, when I get in there, I don't start out with the heaviest weight. Like I usually, like on pull day, for instance, I'll start with a close grip pull down 
and I'll just put a little bit of weight on there and I almost kind of use it to stretch. I use the machine itself to like force stretch me out. Feels pretty good. And then I just kind of will do a couple sets increasing the weight every time. So I don't really, the only time I really do a lot of stretching is before legs. I really try and stretch because you know, all the sitting and laying down we do in modern life makes the hips really tight. So I try to loosen the hips, do my isometric holds for my knees, that kind of thing. That's when I really do a lot of stretching before I do any type of lower body. Okay. So you're putting in the work and it sounds like it's paying off. Is that what, what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's paying off. It's, it's interesting because I kind of, um, I feel like I have one foot and two, each foot is in a different world. It's like I'm in the world of the, of the healthy and I'm also in the world of the very sick simultaneously. I feel like in the people that don't have to deal with this think you're either, it's dualistic thinking, you're either in this group or you're either healthy or you're sick. And you can be both pretty, pretty heavily. Yeah, it's definitely paid off and I'm also still very sick. That's a really interesting, good way to put it. But I suppose it beats the alternative of being sick and also unfit. Sure. I know, absolutely. I would be much worse off if I hadn't done what I did and do what I currently do now, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's neat. So what do you wish more people knew about POTS? I wish more people knew how systemic the disease is. Meaning it's not just it's not a, just a heart rate problem. It's not just a blood pressure problem. It, it affects every organ system of the body to varying degrees in, in different people. So I wish people knew how more more of a entire body impact it can have. I feel like that's I feel like that's not known in the popular culture, and it's also not very well known in the medical community itself. And it doesn't help that POTS is named for just one symptom and like, not even in a very bothersome symptom, in my opinion, it's sort of, sort of like funny to name something for its least bothersome symptom and it makes everybody think like, what's the matter? So your heart is fast and you get to eat a lot of salt. It sounds great, you know? <laughs> yeah, as I understand it, because it's a syndrome, they have to name it after a symptom because the root cause is unknown. So they, by default, call it by the symptom they can measure. They can measure. That's how I understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they figure it out and if they figure out the cause, then they can upgrade the name maybe? That's my understanding. So I just have one last question, which is, sure. is there anything you would like to say to any of your fellow POTS patients out there who may be listening and or why did you agree to let us share your story today? I think most people just kind of want to tell, have someone tell their story to, and I'm no different. So that's, that was my main motivation for getting on here. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't know really what to say to the POTS community other than like, yeah, it's hell. I, you just, I guess, just validate them. That's what I would say. Yeah, I think that's a lot, actually. I yeah, think that's a whole lot. So thank you so much for sharing your story and your insights with so much openness. We really appreciate it. And I know there are patients out there getting a lot out of this just from the few episodes that have aired so far. And We've had requests to hear from male voices. And so thank you for stepping up and volunteering. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. Thank you for having me. And I wish I wish we worked out at the same gym. Then, you know, learn something. <laughs> but hey, listeners, remember, this is not medical advice. Consult your healthcare team about what's right for you because we're all so different. But thank you for tuning in. Remember, you're not alone, and please join us again soon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or on our website, www.standinguptopots.org slash podcast. And I would add, if you have any ideas or topics you'd like to suggest, send them in. You can also engage with us on social media at the handle Standing Up to Pots. Thanks for listening, and we hope you join us. This show is a production of Standing Up to Pots.